welcome to Trendlines, a podcast on global affairs brought to you by World Politics Review. I'm Elliot Waldman. Before we get started, a quick note to our listeners that if you like what you hear on Trendlines, I hope you'll consider subscribing to the show or even leaving a positive review. It really does help sustain our work. And if you'd like to explore all the other topics we've covered in the past, you can find a full archive of the show at worldpoliticsreview.com slash podcast. By now, the term wolf warrior diplomacy has become common parlance, a reference to Chinese envoys and officials who are adopting a stridently nationalistic, even belligerent tone in their statements. Named after a series of patriotic blockbuster films starring Chinese soldiers, the wolf warriors have gained notoriety for defying traditional diplomatic norms. Some of them have even shown a willingness to spread conspiracy theories or use doctored images in order to score points. There's a paradox here, though. China's diplomats are extremely well-credentialed, sophisticated, multilingual, and knowledgeable about their host countries and institutions. They should be the ones tasked with safeguarding Beijing's reputation overseas, yet they engage in aggressive behavior that tends to undermine the traditional goals of diplomacy by hardening foreign attitudes toward China. My guest for today is the author of a new book that examines this phenomenon by taking a deep historical dive into the development of Chinese diplomacy from the early days of the communist revolution and trying to place himself in the shoes of Chinese diplomats on the front lines. Peter Martin is a defense policy and intelligence reporter at Bloomberg News and was previously a Beijing correspondent. His book, which is available anywhere books are sold now, is China's Civilian Army, The Making of Wolf Warrior Diplomacy. Peter, welcome to Trendlines. Thanks so much for having me. This is a book where you set out to put yourself in the shoes of China's sharp elbow diplomats and examine the internal incentives behind their behavior. I imagine it can't have been an easy project, given how secretive the Chinese bureaucracy is. So how did you go about conducting research for the book and what source materials did you use? Yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the kind of best kept secrets about researching Chinese politics is is if you're willing to sit down with turgid um, published materials, then uh, actually the Communist Party tells you quite a lot about what it's doing. Um, if you if you're willing to sit and read these these boring Chinese documents, and so with that in mind, I figured that um, I'd see if if Chinese diplomats had published memoirs, and I knew that a couple of former foreign ministers had and. You know, I, I kind of started using Baidu uh, and Google search terms in Chinese to to try and unearth some, and visiting government bookstores and looking at online um, secondhand book vendors, and, and discovered there were uh, you know well over a hundred uh, memoirs written by former Chinese diplomats, and and so I just started um, kind of working through them as. Um, you know, as, as I came across them or as they kind of fitted with the aspect of Chinese diplomacy I've become interested in. And just it's a question of looking for kind of small hidden details, which are going to illuminate part of a bigger story. I mean, these books are pretty boring. Um, there are, you know, lengthy accounts of and then we got on the plane and then we went to this meeting. Um, some, some of them have um, accounts of like, diplomats personal vacations they took with their families and things like that um but there are also these these moments uh which are really quite revealing especially when you um kind of juxtapose them with a a history of uh chinese diplomacy and the timeline of modern chinese diplomacy so you know when they start to talk about well we we weren't getting any meetings in um fall of 1989 you kind of think well okay well I I know exactly why that is that's because the Tiananmen massacre took place a few months earlier and so once you're willing to start teasing out some of those details these books can become quite revealing. How did you become interested in this topic to begin with? Yeah I mean so I I arrived in Beijing um, in 2017 I had lived there before um, but had been away for a few years and it, it felt like uh, China was kind of at this this moment where its economy had uh, more than doubled in size since 2008. Its military was now in a position to hold U.S. assets in the Pacific at, at, at risk. And uh, it was launching this 
Belt and Road Infrastructure Initiative, uh, capturing headlines around the globe. And at the same time, you know, the Trump administration had entered office and was criticizing U.S. allies and international institutions. So there seemed to be this this real opportunity there for Beijing. And yet somehow uh, China seemed to be doing really well in terms of using coercive tools to to persuade others to follow its lead and offering economic inducements, but it wasn't doing a very good job at using diplomacy or uh, communicating its message. And so I became interested in, you know, why is it that this power is so good at these economic and military means, but, but so lacking in terms of its persuasive power? And that really led me to Chinese diplomats. One thing I think that uh, your book does really well is illuminating this um, this history of, of Chinese diplomacy way back to the early days. And, and the person you spend a lot of time talking about who's most singularly responsible for building and shaping China's modern diplomatic apparatus is uh, Zhou Enlai, the former premier. Can you talk a little bit about his background and, and the kind of ethos that he brought to forging uh, China's diplomacy? Yeah, so Zhou was born in the late 19th century and um, you know came from this kind of genteel family which had hit on hard times and so you know in some ways uh, his background was kind of a, a, a metaphor for the the place that China found itself in the the late 19th and early 20th century um, you know this this kind of proud history but then um, uh, kind of current suffering and, and difficulty and and Joe was drawn in his youth to uh, Marxism and especially uh, after 1917 to the communist revolution in Russia as a way to, uh, to kind of rescue China from the predicament in which it found itself. Um, and, and he, you know, so he joined the communist party in the early 1920s and, and became one of its really most important and early founding members. And, uh, from a very early stage was was intrigued by this question of how China could uh, communicate with the outside and how it uh, needed to build up relationships with the outside in order to to for the Communist Party to strengthen its political movement at home. Um, and so, you know, right right from the beginning, that question of China's reputation was um, was there for him, and he needed to wrestle with. Well, how do we maintain the expectations of of strict discipline and and, and secrecy um, and political orthodoxy that that are required of a communist political movement? How do we reconcile that with the need uh, to communicate with outsiders? In a lot of American textbooks, the history of communist China starts in 1949, which I think causes a lot of people to miss out on the very formative history that. Uh, the earlier chapters in your book talk about, which is the the Chinese Revolution during the 1930s and 1940s. What role did that era play in in shaping Chinese diplomacy even before the formation of the People's Republic? I mean, I think one of the most important things to come out of that era was this sense that um, six, political success is won through struggle um, and uh, often against the odds. Right. So China, uh, the, the Communist Party had failed in its effort to um, promote urban insurrection in China and had turned toward the peasant revolutionary tactics uh, favored by Mao Zedong. It had been effectively chased across the country by the nationalists um, in, a, in a bruising retreat in the 1930s and then had kind of picked itself up by its bootstraps, uh, often without very much help or certainly not as much help as uh, its leaders wanted from the Soviet Union. And so there was this idea that, um, you know, success is fragile and uh, we have to rely on ourselves. And I think that that was um, a really important part of, uh, of the ethos that came out of that period. There was a, especially the experience at the Versailles conference uh, after World War One. That you talk about where the the Chinese delegation was uh, split and uh, divided and came out of it without really being able to achieve their aims with uh, the understanding that well it was because uh, we didn't have any strength and that's why we weren't able to conduct diplomacy right so so I think that um, you know the message for the Communist Party was like we have to rely on ourselves and and work alone and the the assessment that they had of early 20th century Chinese history 
was that uh, China will never be respected on the international stage unless it approaches international politics from a position of strength. It needs a strong economy. It needs to be led by a strong and united political party. Uh, it needs to, to become more technologically advanced. Um, and it needs friends and allies so that it, it's not uh, left out on its own and, uh, and isolated. And I think that um, those instincts kind of really played out after the, the revolution. What are some of the tactics that we see Chinese diplomats adopt to uh, promote this image of strength overseas and, and present a unified front, but also to uh, sort of prevent uh, internal dissent and keep people from straying from the party line? And, and, and how do we still see those uh, tactics displayed today? So when Zhou Enlai became China's first uh, foreign minister in 1949, he had to think about how um, this kind of closed, secretive, paranoid political system could communicate with the outside world. Um, and he came up with this idea that Chinese diplomacy would be modeled on the People's Liberation Army, which had helped propel the communists to victory in the revolution. And the, the PLA... Um, above all, is is loyal to the party. It is highly disciplined. And of course, it had this reputation for um, tremendous fighting spirit um, in terms of battling the nationalists and um, in terms of also fighting the, the Japanese, which the party had um, had kind of spun into a almost larger-than-life um, myth by the time that they won. And uh, so, so Joe told his diplomats that you need to follow this model. You need to be the People's Liberation Army in civilian clothing. And, and what that meant was that they too would be um, you know, disciplined to a fault. They would be highly loyal to the Communist Party. They would um, stand up and use a fighting spirit when, whenever China's interests were, um, were challenged. And, and together with that, were a set of tactics which were aimed at um, kind of maintaining that strict discipline while also uh, communicating with others. And I think one of the most uh, you know distinctive and, and telling bits of behavior which has lasted from 49 to now is this kind of buddy system that they have, the idea that Chinese diplomats will move around in pairs and um, they'll always be someone else there to check uh, what you're saying and, and make sure that it's on message and that um, there's no opportunity for political disloyalty. And that's, that, you know, that's something that suited the party state when it was uh, weak and isolated in 49. And it's something that suits um, Xi Jinping's China now um, for a set of related, but, but you know, somewhat different reasons. There's a really vivid scene in your your book where uh, Joe is sitting in a in a room with uh, th th some like hundred odd uh, former Chinese military commanders and party cadres who are about to become the first uh, diplomats representing China overseas ambassadors. Uh, it, it's really uh, quite something to imagine, you know, from that scene growing into the uh, immense sort of Chinese diplomatic apparatus of today. And, and yet still that consistency that you mentioned uh, from, you know, uh, over the course of seven decades, maintaining uh, that rigid discipline. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's quite unusual, really, for um, for, for any, any political movement, but especially inside China, when you consider that the country went through a communist revolution, famine, economic reform, the rise to superpower status, um, but, but somehow the... Um, the very particular needs of the party state have have always demanded this uh, this very distinctive approach to diplomacy, uh, you know, all the way through till today. While reading your book, I, I definitely felt like you know I was learning about the early history of Chinese diplomacy, but at the same time, there were these themes that I could recognize from the more contemporary era, like the emphasis on South South solidarity around the the Bandung Conference in 1955 poor countries helping other poor countries to lift each other up hand in hand. That's a theme that still features prominently in, in rhetoric around the Belt and Road Initiative. So how do we reconcile that charm offensive, that message of friendship with the strident tone of the wolf warrior diplomats? Because they just really seem to be at, at counter positions with each other. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I think of both of those two instincts as um, 
tactics which have been pursued at different times. Like, you know, so there has been this this kind of strident wolf warrior approach ever since um, 1949, you know, when Chinese diplomats uh, sent uh, a delegation to the United Nations in 1950. Um, their representative there, Wu Xiuquan, delivered a, a two-hour kind of blistering speech which would make, um, you know, the wolf warriors of today even look a little bit wimpish, I think. But, um, you know, and, and in the 1960s, Chinese diplomats were literally using axes on the streets of London to um, to kind of threaten and intimidate protesters outside the embassy. Um, so, the, you know, these, these assertive tactics have been there for a long time, but there have also been, um, I think, equally important periods in Chinese diplomacy where the country has been focused on charming the outside world and winning friends um, and has applied that kind of militaristic discipline to a quite different and um, some might say more productive set of goals from um, a foreign policy perspective. So, you know, you mentioned the, the Bandung Conference in the 1950s. That's one great example, but also the, you know, ne- nearly two decade period after the Tiananmen massacre um, leading up to Beijing's hosting of the 2008 uh, Summer Olympics um, was this amazing period of, of progress for China where um, economic reforms at home and a r- relatively sort of moderate posture toward territorial disputes um, and, uh, and international controversies was paired with this kind of low-key approach to diplomacy, which um, focused on creating conditions for um, China to get its house in order uh, at home and to continue its economic reform program. So I think, you know, there have long been these kind of two tendencies that, that have cycled back and forth. And at the moment, we are, uh, you know, right in the middle, I think, of um, one of the more assertive uh, periods where these these kind of wolf warrior tactics have come to the fore. You spoke with a few uh, career diplomats from outside China who have experience sitting across the table from their Chinese counterparts. What did you glean from conversations with them about uh, the strengths and weaknesses of of this sort of hardline approach that China is taking? Yeah. um, So, you know, I think people who spend a long time with Chinese diplomats come away with this impression that um, on the whole, they're very smart. They're pretty well trained and well informed. Um, they are they are often exhausting because they will stick so closely to their talking points, um, and 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 sometimes this you know this kind of um, uh, lecturing and almost like uh, no, I mean literally shouting that they that they do with foreign interlocutors can um, create some resentments, but. Uh, yeah, especially, I think of a figure like Yang Jiechi, the current uh, China's top diplomat who sits on the Politburo, who um, is able to cycle back and forth between kind of charm and uh, and aggression with with a great deal of ease. But you know, when it comes to the strengths and weaknesses, I think that this ability to um, have all diplomats singing from the same hymn sheet, right, to communicate China's policy preferences with incredible consistency. Um, and and uh, almost a, a sort of tiring relentlessness um, when it comes to issues like Taiwan and Tibet and Xinjiang is uh, is a strength, right? I don't think there's any country in the world who is in any doubt of how the PRC feels about Taiwan. Um, another strength that kind of goes together with that is the ability to uh, present a, a united front. So whereas some countries are negotiating with the US. You think of the Trump administration, it was pretty clear that Peter Navarro had a quite different set of preferences when it came to China policy to Steve Mnuchin. And so uh, China, uh, you know, kind of naturally wanted to get closer to Mnuchin and to um, marginalize Navarro in the bilateral relationship. And that's something that's very difficult to do in the Chinese system. Um China has interagency conflicts just like um, any other country, but they're quite well hidden. And I think that that's that's another strength of the system. There are a whole load of weaknesses. And for me, they come down to this just 
inability to be flexible and to change your approach in order to persuade others. And, and you know, that really kind of cuts to the heart of what diplomacy is all about. There was a, a quote from uh, someone who I can't remember, but it was uh, about how diplomacy is the art of making someone else adopt uh, your own opinions and just sort of feel like they came about it naturally or, or something like that. But it, China's approach just seems completely uh, different than that. Yeah. And, and, you know, to the extent where um, the expectation a lot of the time seems to be that um, foreign countries should should just repeat China's talking points. Um, uh, you know, that's that's certainly the approach, I think, that uh, the government often has to um, the way that its interlocutors should uh, should behave. When you step back and, and just take a look at the historical sweep of the book, it's it's pretty remarkable the the really high peaks and deep troughs that that Chinese diplomacy went through because you had the the crackdown of the Cultural Revolution during the '60s, which decimated the diplomatic corps, and then in the 1970s uh, there were these huge crowning successes of of joining the United Nations uh, and later establishing diplomatic relations with the U.S. and Japan. Then there was the isolation that followed the Tiananmen Square massacre, which you mentioned, and the turmoil of the Cold War. We, we've talked about the uh, admirable consistency that, that Chinese diplomats have maintained throughout it all. I'm wondering to what extent there was also an evolution uh, to adapt to uh, changes in the global ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, China is... Uh and you know, Chinese leaders are kind of Im- impressively aware at times of the constellation of forces around them in the world and, and are constantly thinking about what that means for China's international posture. So, so one of the things that's really striking about the last 70 years of Chinese diplomacy under the uh, Communist Party is this ability to recalibrate Beijing's foreign policies. Um you know, it, it, at times, I think, especially of the, of the Cultural Revolution here, it seemed like um, China has ended up so alienated um, and has has adopted such a confrontational and ideological posture that it would be hard to um, to kind of win back any of its previous gains. And yet, you know, out of that period came Kissinger and Nixon's um, visits to Beijing, and total reorientation of China's place in the Cold War out of the Tiananmen massacre came this uh, multi-decade charm offensive, which culminated in the Olympics. And so a lot of the time under the surface um, during these periods where China has been at odds with the West and the rest of the world is a rethink that's taking place, which allows the country to kind of pivot towards a stance which um, will improve its international reputation. I think one of the really crucial questions for China watchers right now is, is that rethink taking place? And is China still capable of, uh, of, of pivoting in that way under its current leadership? Where do you come down on that question? So I think that there are a few signs that um, there is a rethink going on. Uh, I just don't know how deep it will run. So... I guess I'll, I'll, I'll talk through a few of them. Um, there was a report um, relatively recently from a prominent Chinese think tank called Kika, which is under the Ministry of State Security, which talked about um, a, a major international backlash against China unseen since the days of the Tiananmen massacre. Um, there's Pew Global Opinion polling, which is you know show, shows this backlash too, and I know is is seen in Beijing. And there are prominent former Chinese diplomats warning that China's policy has kind of overextended and is starting to um, alienate the outside world. And I think we've we've seen a recognition of those signs uh, in, you know, there was a recent Politburo um, study session uh, led by Xi Jinping, where he talked about the need for China to create a lovable image and, you um, to be more to be more humble in its um, and, and, and low key in its international approach. So I do think that there is um, some recognition from the top leadership. I think to me though that the the problem is that the current backlash against China is so deep rooted in in Western countries and and in developing countries. You know, like you think of India as well. And there's been a major backlash against Beijing. That I I don't know that a 
recalibration in wolf warrior tactics would be enough i think that um you know there's opposition on everything from china's approach to the south china sea to beijing's industrial po- and trade policies to the consolidation of power under uh, xi jinping to china's policies in xinjiang and hong kong without some kind of reset in policy that that accompanies a diplomatic reset i'm not sure that it would really be successful and and i guess the problem i see is that um although xi jinping has has recognized that china's image has suffered i don't see any sign that he intends to um to shift away from any of those core policies and so so i'm kind of doubtful about how successful a, a, a near term reset could be when we talk about wolf warrior diplomacy uh the poster child i think is is Zhao Lijian the foreign ministry spokesperson who famously floated a conspiracy theory about the origins of covid-19 claiming that the us army had manufactured the coronavirus What's your read of how Zhao is seen within the foreign ministry? Is is he a model to aspire toward, or is he a more kind of polarizing figure? My impression, and and you know, it's uh, it's always incredibly difficult to discern these things um, from in chi- inside the Chinese system, right? So, uh, we you know, with that very important uh, proviso, my my impression is that he is quite a divisive figure. Um, there are. Uh, you know, when, when he arrived back in Beijing after his stint in um, Pakistan, where he, he kind of catapulted to prominence after picking a Twitter fight with former U.S. National Security Advisor Susan Rice. You know, when, when he arrived back in the foreign ministry, there was a group of young Chinese diplomats waiting outside his office to kind of cheer his return. And so it's clear that there is a strong constituency inside the foreign ministry and um, the Chinese diplomatic apparatus that likes his style and likes his new approach. Uh, it's also clear that he was, you know, promoted to, to that position where he is now one of the most prominent faces of the Chinese government uh, in the world um, as a result, likely as a result of his, his tactics. So clearly there is some support, but um, when you look at the responses of, Others, I think, especially uh, older generations and more seasoned diplomats inside the system, there seems to be some dissatisfaction. So the current uh, Chinese ambassador to uh, the US, Tsui Tian Kai, described uh, the kind of theory that Zhao promoted about the origins of coronavirus as um, crazy um, and, and clearly has not embraced those kind of tactics in the same way. And so uh, I think I think in some ways that the rise of Zhao Lijin reflects um, this, this enduring debate in Chinese diplomacy between um, kind of charm tactics and, and, and wolf warrior tactics. Yeah, that, that debate between him and the uh, ambassador to the U.S. that spilled over into public view was, was quite remarkable. It was one of the few times we've actually seen something like that happening Uh, in the public eye yeah it was um i mean i think i think it's important not to um overstate that i think that the the disagreement there is really about um tactics but on on a kind of more fundamental level i think that there is a a widespread understanding in the chinese system that china's position in the world has changed And it's not possible for the world's second largest economy and, uh, you know, this incredibly powerful military to adopt the kind of low profile um, approach that it had in the past. You know, some Chinese diplomats like to phrase it uh, in in, in this way. They say um, you can't hide an elephant. And, uh, you know, it's this idea that China has now reached a place where it does need to... um, assume a leadership role. And in, indeed, on issues like uh, Iran and North Korea and climate change, it's expected by the world to play a leadership role. So how does it reconcile those changed expectations with um, the ability to still win friends and um, and, and build influence and persuade others? Um, so it's kind of those new circumstances have also demanded a new approach. And, and Chinese diplomats like Tui and, and Zhao are kind of wrestling with um, the right mix of tactics that will be needed to, to meet that challenge. 
One of the other th interesting themes that comes out in your book is this intense scrutiny and pressure that's on Chinese diplomats uh, as a result of their position. It seems like from the very beginning, a lot of them were regarded with suspicion within the, the bureaucracy. And, and that is part of what led to the, the, the buddy system that you mentioned being adopted. Um, how much do you think that is still the case now? And how do Chinese diplomats deal with that intense pressure? Yeah, I, I, I do think um, it's been very important right from the beginning. Sometimes it's been um, elite opinion, you know, the opinion of Mao Zedong and, and those around him or the opinion of Xi Jinping. And sometimes uh, like in the 1990s and, and 2000s, it was kind of the nationalist public opinion that, that kept Chinese diplomats up at night. But I think um, even more so than other political systems, um, Chinese diplomats are worried about domestic audiences and um, how they're perceived at home before they're worried about how foreign interlocutors are interpreting their message and um, whether they're being truly persuasive. At the end of your book, you observe that uh, Chinese diplomats spend more of their time looking back over their shoulders than out into the world. Do you expect that will remain the case for the foreseeable future? Yeah, I think I think it will. I think that that really is um, there's, there's kind of a, an upper limit to the effectiveness of Chinese diplomats in my mind, which is set um, not by the capabilities of of the individual members of Chinese diplomatic China's diplomatic corps, who, as you said, can be very impressive and urbane and sophisticated and have great experience dealing with the outside world, but I think that upper limit is really set by China's political system. Um, there is um, an expectation of loyalty and political conformity, which really um, puts a straitjacket on those guys and, 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 and constrains their ability to be um, truly persuasive. Now, I think that clearly uh, the political system does allow for periods uh, like the mid-1950s and the 1990s where um, that discipline is applied to um, improving China's reputation. So, so clearly it's possible to make a great deal of progress even within those strictures, but I don't see that fundamental challenge of constantly having to look over your shoulder and thinking about what the leadership thinks about you. Um, I didn't see that going away. Peter, thank you so much for making the time today. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure. Peter Martin is a defense policy and intelligence reporter at Bloomberg News, and we've been talking about his new book, China's Civilian Army, The Making of Wolf Warrior Diplomacy. If you'd like to comment on the discussion, ask a question, or even suggest a topic for a future episode, drop us a line at podcast at worldpoliticsreview.com. This episode of Trend Lines was produced by me, Elliot Waldman, and edited by Peter Dury. You can follow the team on Twitter if you'd like. WPR's handle is at WPReview. I'm at Elliot Waldman with two L's, one T, and Peter is at P-E-T-E-R-D-O-E-R-R-I-E. -E -E. Thanks for listening, and tune in again next week.